Hi, it's Tarrant. And Stella from Maple University on the Dice Tower. Today we'll be teaching you how to play Primal The Awakening. Game designed by Tommaso Mondadori and Alberto Parisi and published by Reggie Games. We are using a prototype copy of the game and so the rules and components are not final. Let's get to the table. Primal The Awakening is a cooperative game in which up to four players will go through scenarios in which they encounter a terrifying monster in the wilderness which they are required to defeat. Through a combination of tactics and clever card play, players will do their best to defeat the monsters and understand the secrets of the land of Thyria. A Primal The Awakening campaign begins with a prologue, which will teach you the basics of the game, followed by a campaign lasting between 11 and 15 scenarios. The game also comes with an expedition mode in which you can set up and play standalone scenarios. In this video, we'll primarily focus on the rules and setup that you need to play the prologue. Later on, we'll touch on how to play the campaign, although we won't go through it in full detail. Your scenario book will tell you how to set up the main board for that scenario. You will always place the monster miniature in the centre of the map, and then you'll place your hero miniatures and terrain type tokens in various places according to the scenario. In the prologue you will use Viraxon, the dragon enemy, the hunters will be in the forward sector, and then you'll have Brush, Bethanus and Syrake in these locations. Place the round counter on round one. Take the board that matches your monster and its aggression level, and in the prologue that's going to be Viraxon at aggression level one. Take all of the other cards matching that monster and aggression level. This will be important in the full game as sometimes you'll face the same monster at different aggression levels. You'll have four decks of cards. The stances will look like this, the peril cards will be black, the objective cards white, and the behaviour cards will show the monster's picture on the back. Shuffle the behaviours and place one into each of these three spaces. In some cases, not all of the behaviour cards are shuffled in at once. Some are held back until later in the scenario. And then find the stance card which is labelled number one in the top right corner, placing it here. Any peril or objective cards labelled one or one asterisk go in these two places respectively, and any other stances, perils and objectives are placed off to the side for later. Peril cards are special abilities that the monsters have in their fight against the hunters, and objectives are special weaknesses that the monsters have that the hunters can exploit. Nearby you'll also shuffle and place the 10 attrition cards, which are the same for all monsters. Each player then sets up their hunter, and you'll need between 2 and 4 hunters in every scenario. If you are playing solo, you'll need to control 2 hunters. Each hunter enters the prologue with the basic weapon matching its player board. It will also have a basic helm, basic armour, and an Aylmore potion, and all of these will be black in colour. The hunter will have a deck of cards which matches its weapon, and these will all be of the level 1 cards, that is with a 1 in the bottom right corner. You should find that this deck has the same number of colours matching these icons here, and this deck is shuffled before being placed next to the board. The hunter also begins with one level 1 mastery card, again referring to the number in the bottom right corner. And if your hunter has more than one, choose the one that you'd prefer. This is placed black side up, and it represents an ability that you don't have access to yet. Set aside any upgraded weapons or cards, as well as any wound cards. Each hunter has its own wound cards, showing its own icon on the back. Then pick who's going to be the first player in the first round, and that player takes the aggro token. Although this serves as the first player token, it has other purposes in the game. Finally, each player draws a hand of five cards from their deck, and may do a once-off mulligan, discarding any number of cards desired, and then drawing back up to five. Once all players have done this, you're ready for the first round of the game.
A scenario in Primal the Awakening is played in up to 10 rounds, and each round is played in three phases. First, the monster phase, then the actions phase, and then the end of round phase. The vast majority of play is going to occur in the actions phase. The monster phase is really just a setup stage for the monster, but the monster is going to do most of its attacking during the actions phase, responding to the actions that the heroes take. The game plays over a maximum of 10 rounds, and your overall objective in most scenarios is to kill the monster inside that time. Doing this requires defeating the monster in each of its three stances. Defeating Varaxxon in its first stance will take 18, 24 or 28 damage, depending on your player count. This would then be replaced with the second stance, requiring 24, 28 or 35 hits which is then replaced with the third stance, requiring 28, 35 or 45 hits to defeat. Later in the campaign, you may find some scenarios with other objectives other than simply defeating the monster. Each round begins with the monster phase, and this is kind of like a setup phase for the monster. This is resolved in the following steps. First, if any hunter wishes to use a potion with the consume keyword, this is done now. Resolve the text and then discard that potion from the campaign. Then the monster gains one struggle token per player in the game. Struggle is used as a currency by the monster in order to make certain abilities more powerful against the hunters. If at this stage or any other, the monster is to gain struggle and already has 10 or more struggle, then resolve the monster's unleash ability. This should be written on the monster's peril card, but if not, you'll resolve the default unleash action, which is that all players will suffer damage equal to the current stance's attrition value. Next, if the monster has a peril effect with the upkeep keyword, this resolves now. Finally, switch behavior cards. Take the card or cards with the lowest number in the bottom left corner and then remove them and discard them, replacing them from the top of the behavior deck. This stops these cards, which trigger the monster's actions, from becoming stale. Should you need to draw a behavior card and the deck is empty, then shuffle the discard pile back into the deck and the monster gains one struggle. This is known as escalation and may cause some other effects to trigger. Then proceed to the actions phase. In the actions phase, each hunter will take one turn, beginning with the player who has the aggro token at the start of the phase and going clockwise from there, irrespective of where this token moves during the round. Each turn is resolved in four steps, movement, sequence, attrition, and end of turn. Throughout this, the player's turn will be frequently interrupted by the monster taking an action, and this will be triggered each time the condition shown on the back of one of the three active behavior cards occurs. When this icon occurs, you would halt the player's turn, flip and resolve the card, and then discard it and draw a new one. And so players will need to keep this in mind when choosing their actions. Throughout the action phase, Many actions need to be paid for using stamina. This can come from a stored stamina token, or by discarding one or more cards from hand in order to gain the stamina shown in the bottom left corner of the card. Each action is paid for discreetly, so you could not, for example, use this card to pay for two one stamina actions. You are allowed to overpay for an action and may choose to do so, particularly as some actions combo off what you use to pay for them, but you do not get any change for overpaid stamina. So now we'll go through each step in detail, and before the active player even starts taking an action, you need to check to see if you resolve a start of turn monster behavior. A behavior showing this icon resolves if the active player starts their turn in the front sector relative to the monster's current orientation. This behavior triggers if the active player begins in the rear of the monster's current orientation, and one with this icon triggers if the active player starts in either of the flanks. After resolving any such behaviors, you'll go on to movement. 
Here the active player has two options. Firstly, stay in their current sector and then gain a threat token if they don't already have one. Alternatively, pay one stamina to move to an adjacent sector and discard any threat token that they have. The premise here is that if you don't keep moving, then it's going to be easier for the monster to work out where you are and attack you. And you'll find that there are many effects in the game which become worse if you've got a threatened token. Any sector that contains a player who has a threat token is considered a threatened sector, and there are some effects that combo off that as well. After you've chosen or declined to move, it's time for the sequence phase. Here, the active player will play cards from hand into a sequence, resolving the effects on the card, as well as any others that trigger, in order to try to harm the monster. This is the major card play puzzle in the game. The player's sequence phase will continue until either they no longer wish to play any other cards in sequence, or until playing a maximum of five. Cards played in the sequence phase are played one at a time and each is fully resolved before the next is played. The first step of playing a card is to pay its stamina cost, which is this number showing in the top left corner of the card. Most cards cost 0 or 1, but some of the more powerful cards will cost 2 or even up to 4. They may even go higher beyond the prologue. Then. If the aggro icon in the top right corner of the card is red, rather than grey, then the active player must take the aggro token. This will, in particular, affect how the monster moves in the end of turn phase. Then resolve all of the effects on that card, and on any other cards that are triggered by this card. These may be resolved in any order, but all of them must be resolved before playing your next card. These effects are Anything written in text on the card. The bonus effects for your offensive cards, which are the red and blue ones showing this icon. For a red card, this means you do damage to the monster equal to your weapon's damage value, this number here, so in this case, 3 damage. However, do note that you are not allowed to play a red card into your sequence unless you are standing in a vulnerable sector. Refer to the monster's current stance card and look at this icon. The lines pointing out of the circle represent the direction that the monster is currently facing, and the red sectors are the vulnerable sectors. So right now, you would only be allowed to play a red card if you were in front or in the rear of the monster, not on the flanks. When you play a blue card into the sequence, your immediate offensive bonus is to remove one struggle token from the monster. Look for any cards that have additional triggering effects, such as these arrows. This card here allows you to draw one if the card to the left of it in your sequence is yellow, so you would get to do that effect. At the same time, playing this card triggers this effect on the already placed yellow card, because there's now a red card placed to its right, so this would allow you to deal this additional damage immediately. There may also be a combo on your weapon. For example, having two red cards in a row in this sequence triggers this great sword effect. You may end up placing counters onto your mastery card. Here, placing two red cards in a row would allow you to place a token on the card. And once you have as many tokens as the numbers showing in this black triangle, you'll remove the counters and flip your mastery card over. This will give you some new effect, which takes effect immediately, if appropriate. Any card effect showing these crossed swords becomes active as well once you've flipped your mastery card over. Once flipped, you remain a master of this skill for the rest of the scenario. After you've played and resolved a card in your sequence, resolving all effects in whatever order you want, you now need to check the monster's behaviour cards and see whether there are any triggered off that colour of card you will resolve any such cards now. Then you'll return to play the next card into your sequence, continuing to do this until you either no longer have enough stamina to pay for any more, or until you no longer wish to play any more. You are allowed to keep cards in hand at the end of your turn. You may not play more than five cards into your sequence on a given turn. The next step is attrition, and here you'll draw the top card from the attrition deck or, 
if you have a threat token, then you will draw the top two and choose the higher of the two. Then refer to your sequence. If there are at least as many defensive cards, which are the yellow and green ones showing this icon, in your sequence as the attrition card you drew, then you successfully defend against the monster this turn. But if there are fewer defensive cards than the attrition card you've drawn, then you get hit. Irrespective of how far short you were on defensive symbols, you'll now suffer damage equal to the attrition value on the monster's current stance. So here, one damage. This will tend to escalate as monsters proceed to later stances. Then discard the attrition cards that you drew in the order that you drew them. There are some effects in the game which will combo off the top card of the attrition deck as a randomizer, so it's important that you retain this order. The game's 10 attrition cards range in value from 0 to 3. Finally, you'll proceed to the end of turn phase. Discard your sequence, in the order that you played it, to a personal discard pile. If there are two or more cards remaining in your hand at this point, then you gain a stored stamina token. As we saw before, you can pay this as part of a stamina cost, but you're only allowed to hold one of these at any given time. Then draw back up to, or discard down to, your current hand limit, which starts the game as 5, but can be altered through the game. If you need to still draw cards and your deck is empty, then shuffle up your discard pile, suffer damage equal to your weapon's level, which is this number up in the top right corner below the title, and then finish drawing. Finally, determine which player currently has the aggro token and rotate the monster to face that player. Play now passes to the next player clockwise. There are two types of card which may be used when it is not your turn. The first is an assist card, and any inactive player may discard a card showing the assist keyword, not having to pay its cost, and not resolving the text on the card, in order to make the active player draw one card from their deck. If the card says Quick Assist, then both the active player and the player who's discarding the card draw new cards. This is not considered to be playing a card, and so the red aggro icon does nothing. Assisting is a good way for other players to sacrifice part of their turn in order to help a player get one really good sequence. The other is a card showing the reaction keyword, and the reaction effect will show exactly when that card is triggered. Here again, such a card may be discarded out of turn, or in turn, in order to resolve the reaction effect as shown, and this will not cost stamina, and not trigger any aggro token movement. Cards with assist or reaction effects can also be played as part of your sequence, and they'll still count as the colour shown, but the assist and reaction effects will not resolve if played in this way. After all players have taken a turn during the action phase, you will proceed to the end of round phase. In this quick phase, you will resolve the end of round behaviour card if there is one on the board, then advance the round marker and proceed to the monster phase of the next round. If this was already the 10th round of the game, then the game is over. We've already seen many of the ways that monster behaviours trigger. These will trigger when you play a card of the matching colour, these will trigger when you start in the matching sector as the active player, and this triggers at the end of the round. A behaviour card with this icon triggers by another behaviour card being resolved, meaning if this is one of the active cards, then the next card you resolve is going to result in this one coming out as well. A card with this icon triggers whenever the monster rotates, and the star is a special trigger which will be outlined on the monster's peril or objective card. Whatever the case, a behaviour card is resolved in the following way. You will flip the card over, and then resolve any text in the black field. Then, if the card has a boost effect, printed in the white field at the bottom, first check to see if the monster has at least as many struggle tokens as shown in this icon. If so, spend that many tokens and resolve the boost effect. Some boost effects are conditional. Here, for example, only players in a flank sector are affected. If there are no such players, 
the monster will still spend this amount of struggle and attempt to resolve that effect. Once the card has been completely resolved, discard it and replace it with the top card from the behaviour deck. Some effects may remain for a little bit longer. This one for example remains until the very end of the round, only after which it is discarded and replaced. Remember that, should you be trying to draw from an empty deck, you will shuffle the discard pile, draw from the new deck, and gain one struggle token. A hunter enters a scenario with life points equal to the sum of these numbers in the bottom right corner of the helm and armour. So in the prologue, 8. A hunter who gains at least that much damage is knocked out. Go through the following steps. If you are the active player, then your turn ends immediately. Whether it's your turn or not, discard your entire hand to your discard pile, and then add one of your character's wounds onto the top of the discard pile. The wound has no effect other than to dilute your deck. Place a deplete token on both your helm and your armour. This reduces the number of life points of each of them by half rounded down. So while originally these provided 3 and 5 for a total of 8, now they provide only 1 and 2 for a total of 3 health. Deplete tokens and wounds in your deck are permanent in the campaign until you spend resources to remove them between scenarios. Then place a knockout token on its red side on your player board and lay down your mini on the map. While you are knocked out, you are ignored by the monster for the purposes of all behaviour cards, but you still count as part of the player count of the game for the purposes of the monster gaining struggle in the monster phase and other such effects. By being knocked out, you will effectively lose a turn, and so next time it is your turn to be the active player, you will take no actions other than flipping the knocked out token over to the black side. The following turn, you'll re-enter the game as follows. Discard the knockout token, remove all damage, draw to your hand limit, and then stand up your mini. You'll now complete your turn as normal, but you will ignore threat, and you will skip your attrition phase. You are ultimately aiming to defeat the monster by defeating it in its three stances. As soon as the monster has taken damage, equaling or exceeding its current stances threshold, then go through the following steps. First you should remove the amount of health equal to the current stance's threshold, so this may mean that any excess damage remains for the next stance. Discard the old stance card and reveal the new one. Resolve any when revealed effect on the new stance card. Then adjust the peril and objective cards. Any old cards which do not show an asterisk are removed, while ones containing an asterisk remain then any new perils or objectives matching the new stance number are added. You'll then continue with your turn. Peril cards provide some additional abilities, above and beyond the behaviour cards, which the monster uses to attack you. While objectives often provide a powerful way of attacking the monster back. Here for example on Viraxon's Let's Hit the Tail, players will add counters to the card every time they use an attack card from the monster's rear, and upon hitting a minimum criterion, will do a large amount of damage. In most scenarios, once you have defeated a monster's third stance, the scenario is over and the players have won. If you have not defeated the monster inside 10 rounds, or all players are knocked out at the same time, then the scenario is lost. There are a number of keywords on cards which you'll need to understand to play the game. A recycle keyword allows the player to discard and then redraw the number of cards shown. Volley lets the player discard that number of cards from the top of their deck and then do their weapons damage for each red card discarded. Some cards have an opening effect, which triggers only if it's the first card in a sequence while some upgraded equipment has the start keyword, which resolves at the start of the active player's turn. Some cards, especially strong ones, might give you a strain token, which reduces your hand limit for your next end of turn phase. While there are many that let you interfere with the monster, Confuse lets you discard two behaviour cards and replace them from the deck, 
A stealth card can be played without triggering a behaviour card of the matching colour. Blinding lets you choose a peril card and cancel its effect for the rest of the round. Stunning lets you choose a behaviour card and cancel its trigger for the rest of the round. And Vulnerability doubles the next damage the monster receives. There are also some keywords which mean nothing on their own, but which combo off other cards in the corresponding deck. Aim, Slash, Rampage and Firestorm are all examples of these. The little head represents your player count, and so this will be read such that this number is 2 times your player count, and this number is 5 times your player count. And the little weapon icon represents the level of the corresponding weapon, so this would read as 2 times the current level of the hammer. There are also terrain tokens in the game that you need to understand and exploit in your battle. The Bethanus is a healing herb, and if you start your turn with one or more Bethanus, you heal one damage per Bethanus. The Syrike helps you in combat, and when you play a red attack card in a region with Syrike, you add additional damage equal to the level of your weapon. Brush helps you manipulate the turn order. If you are in a sector with Brush, then, as long as you've resolved any start of turn effects, you may hide in the Brush. At this point, name another player, and then pass your turn to the next player in turn order. After the named player has finished their turn, then the player in the brush comes out and continues their turn where it left off. Finally, for the prologue, there is fire, and Varaxon is going to set things on fire. A player who is in a sector that is on fire is not allowed to play any cards from hand, and effectively skips, or ends, the sequence phase of their turn. Fire also burns brush. As part of the end of round phase, any red fire tokens are flipped to the yellow side, and any yellow fire tokens are removed. If a sector is on fire, and there is ever another trigger to set it on fire again, then instead, any players in that region gain one damage. There are some other terrains which will come up in later scenarios, but we'll leave you to learn them when you come to the scenario. Primal The Awakening is a campaign game which is played across between 11 and 15 scenarios. After any scenario is complete, you will either mark off the next box on the aggression track if you are successful, making the next monsters more aggressive and stronger, or you'll mark off a box in the defeat track. Sometimes you'll be able to try a defeated scenario again, but in other cases the narrative will preclude it. As rewards for completing scenarios, you'll earn resources, herbs and experience points, as well as new catalogues of goodies that you can get from the Forge and the Alchemist. Then, if you trigger an event on the aggression track, you'll resolve an event. Then, you'll choose a quest from the quest board, which determines which enemy you're about to go and face. Primal The Awakening is not a simple linear narrative, you've got many options depending on which quests you have available and which ones you succeed at. Then comes the garrison phase, where you'll spend your resources on new or repaired equipment, you'll spend herbs on potions, and increasing your experience gives you access to higher levels of card which you can choose to put into your deck at the start of the scenario. As you go through this, you'll start to be introduced to the game's elementals. There are six elements, and certain equipment or monsters are stronger against some and weaker against others. Then finally comes the hunt phase, where you'll set up for and head into your next scenario. Finally, if you don't wish to play the campaign, you can also play the game in Expedition Mode, where you'll play standalone scenarios against many of the game's different monsters. To set up for these scenarios, you will need to assemble specific decks of cards, because some of the more difficult monsters are balanced to play deeper into the campaign, where the characters are already strong so you won't be able to face those monsters using the basic deck. And that's how to play Primal The Awakening. We hope you enjoyed this video. When we film this video, Primal The Awakening is going to Kickstarter. So we'll put the link in the description below when it is live, so you can check it out. If you enjoyed this video, please help us by hitting that like button and subscribe to the Dice Tower if you haven't already done so. And if you have any questions, comments or feedback, please leave them in the comment section below. Until next time!